Maybe it is inspired about religious liberty. God said if anybody differs with you about religion, kill him. He told his peculiar people, if anyone teaches a different religion, kill him. He did not say try and convince him that he is wrong, but kill him. He did not say I am in the miracle business and I will convince him, but kill him. He said to every husband, if your wife that you love as you love your own soul says, let us go and worship other gods, then thy hand shall be the first upon her, and she shall be stoned with stones until she dies. Well, now, I hate a god of that kind, and I cannot think of being nearer heaven than to be away from him. A god tells a man to kill his wife simply because she differs with him on religion. If the real god were to tell me to kill my wife, I would not do it. If you had lived in Palestine at that time and your wife, the mother of your children, had woke up at night and said, I am tired of Jehovah. He is always turning up that board bill. He is always telling about whipping the Egyptians. He is always killing somebody. I am tired of him. Let's worship the sun. The sun has clothed the world in beauty. It has covered the earth with green and flowers. By its divine light, I first saw your face. Its light has enabled me to look into the eyes of my beautiful babe. Let us worship the sun, father and mother of light and love and joy. Then what would it be your duty to do? Kill her? Do you believe a real God ever did that? Your hand should be first upon her, and when you took up some ragged rock and hurled it against a white bosom filled with love for you, and saw running away the red current of her sweet life, then you would look up to heaven and receive the congratulations of the infinite fiend whose commandments you had to obey. I guess the Bible was not inspired about religious liberty. Let me ask you right here. Suppose, as a matter of fact, God gave those laws to the Jews and told them whenever a man preaches a different religion, kill him. And suppose that afterwards the same God took upon himself flesh and came to the world and taught and preached a different religion. And the Jews crucified him, did he not reap exactly what he sowed? Maybe this book is inspired about war. God told the Israelites to overrun that country and kill every man, woman, and child for defending their native land. Kill the old men? Yes. Kill the women? Certainly. And the little dimpled babes in the cradle that smile and coo in the face of murder? Dash out their brains. This is the will of God. Will you tell me that any God ever commanded such infamy? Kill the men and the women and the young men and the babes. What shall we do with the maiden? Give them to the rabble murderers. Do you believe that God ever allowed the roses of love and the violets of modesty that shed their perfume in the heart of a maiden to be trampled beneath the brutal feet of lust? If there is any God, I pray to him to write in the book of eternal remembrance opposite to my name that I denied that lie. Whenever a woman reads a Bible and comes to that passage, she ought to throw the book from her in contempt and scorn. Do you tell me that any decent God would do that? What would the devil have done under the same circumstances? Just think of it. And yet that is the God that we want to get into the Constitution. That is the God we teach our children about, so that they will be sweet and tender, amiable and kind. That monster, that fiend. I guess the Bible is not inspired about religious liberty, nor about war. Then if it is not inspired about these things, maybe it is inspired about slavery. God tells the Jews to buy up the children of the heathen round about. 
and they should be servants for them. What is a servant? If they struck a servant and he died immediately, punishment was to follow. But if the injured man should linger a while, there was no punishment, because the servant represented their money. Do you believe that it is right that God made one man to work for another and to receive pay in rations? Do you believe God said that a whip on the naked back was the legal tender for labor performed? Is it possible that the real God ever gave such infamous bloodthirsty laws? What more does he say? When the time of a married slave expired, he could not take his wife and children with him. Then, if the slave did not wish to desert his family, he had his ears pierced with an awl and became his master's property forever. Do you believe that God ever turned the dimpled cheeks of little children into iron chains to hold a man in slavery? Do you know that a God like that would not make a respectable devil? I want none of his mercy. I want no part and no lot in the heaven of such a God. I will go to perdition where there is human sympathy. The only voice we have ever had from either of those other worlds came from hell. There was a rich man who prayed his brothers to attend to Lazarus so that they might not come to this place. That is the only instance, so far as we know, of souls across the river having any sympathy. And I would rather be in hell asking for water than in heaven denying that petition. Well, what is this book inspired about? Where does the inspiration come from? Why was it that so many animals were killed? It was simply to make atonement for man, that is all. They killed something that had not committed a crime in order that the one who had committed the crime might be acquitted. Based upon that idea is the atonement of the Christian religion. That is the reason I attack this book, because it is the basis of another infamy, viz. that one man can be good for another or that one man can sin for another. I deny it. You have got to be good for yourself. You have got to sin for yourself. The trouble about the atonement is that it saves the wrong man. For instance, I kill someone. He is a good man. He loves his wife and children and tries to make them happy, but he is not a Christian and goes to hell. Just as soon as I am convicted and cannot get a pardon, I get religion and I go to heaven. The hand of mercy cannot reach down through the shadows of hell to my victim. There is no atonement for the saint, only for the sinner and the criminal. The atonement saves the wrong man. I have said that I would never make a lecture at all without attacking this doctrine. I did not care what I started out on. I was always going to attack this doctrine. And in my conclusion, I want to draw you a few pictures of the Christian heaven. But before I do that, I want to say the rest I have to say about Moses. I want you to understand that the Bible was never printed until 1488. I want you to know that up to that time, it was in manuscript, in possession of those who could change it if they wished. And they did change it, because no two ever agreed. Much of it was in the wastebasket of credulity, in the open mouth of tradition, and in the dull ear of memory. I want you also to know that the Jews themselves never agreed as to what books were inspired, and that there were a lot of books written that were not incorporated in the Old Testament. I want you to know that two or three years before Christ, the Hebrew manuscript was translated into Greek, and that the original from which the translation was made has never been seen since. Some Latin Bibles were found in Africa, but no two agreed, and then they translated the Septuagint into the languages of Europe, and no two agreed. Henry VIII took a little time between murdering his wives to see that the word of God was translated correctly. You must recollect that we are indebted to murderers for our Bibles and our creeds. Constantine, who helped on the good work at its early stage, 
murdered his wife and child, mingling their blood with the blood of the Savior. The Bible that Henry VIII got up did not suit, and then his daughter, the murderess of Mary, Queen of Scots, got up another edition, which also did not suit, and finally that philosophical idiot, King James, prepared the edition which we now have. There are at least 100,000 errors in the Old Testament, but everybody sees that it is not enough to invalidate its claim to infallibility. But these errors are gradually being fixed, and hereafter the prophet will be fed by Arabs instead of ravens, and Samson's 300 foxes will be 300 sheaves already bound, which were fired and thrown into the standing wheat. I want you all to know that there was no contemporaneous literature at the time the Bible was composed, and that the Jews were infinitely ignorant in their day and generation, that they were isolated by bigotry and wickedness from the rest of the world. I want you to know that there are 1,400 millions of people in the world, and that with all the talk and work of the societies, only 120 millions have got Bibles. I want you to understand that not one person in 100 in this world ever read the Bible, and no two ever understood it alike who did read it, and that no one person probably ever understood it aright. I want you to understand that where this Bible has been, Man has hated his brother. There have been dungeons, racks, thumbscrews, and the sword. I want you to know that the cross has been in partnership with the sword, and that the religion of Jesus Christ was established by murderers, tyrants, and hypocrites. I want you to know that the church carried the black flag. Then talk about the civilizing influence of this religion.